Brown in Brownsville, Texas. Here behind me, we have a very efficient operation called Camp Monument. This is a, 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 a setup that we did with Border Patrol agents from day one when we started seeing a migrant influx enter right through this area of responsibility for us. Um, to date, since April 16th, we have uh, screened and processed close to 30,000 migrants coming in through this area, mostly Venezuela nationals, um, followed by Colombia, as well as Ecuador. This is a system that is efficient for us. It's an area that we monitor daily, and uh, we have about maybe 36 to 38 agents that are dedicated here for this operation. Number one goal is to do intake processing, to do security, to ensure the safety of everyone, and then third, transportation, to get them from the field here, this location, to facilities, whether it's border patrol stations, whether it's our central processing centers, or whether it's to a port of entry, because Title 42 is still in place. So therefore, we are in coordination with government of Mexico to return Venezuela nationals back into Mexico on a daily basis, as well as the other sectors that are helping us throughout the southwest border to decompress. RGV for many years have seen an increase of, of migrant um, encounters. This is not new to us. We are a mature sector. I call it a mega sector because we have a very large region. This workforce is experienced, it's mature, it's very skilled. They know exactly what they're doing. In three days, they were able to set up this operation on the ground for us to have an efficient throughput of processing, intake, medical screening, as well as transport to other locations. My thanks go out to every single Border Patrol agent from RGV that is out here every day supporting the operation, whether you're doing it here physically or by virtual processing from different stations, locations out here. Kudos goes out to all the other sectors along the southwest border and around the nation because northern border agents are also doing virtual processing to support RGV operations as well as coastal um, uh, sectors that are supporting virtual processing. This uh, is a community effort. This is not something that the Border Patrol or CBP for that matter is doing alone. We get our strength from our community, from our community stakeholders, like local law enforcement, like our federal partners, Everyone has a hand in this today. And I couldn't be more happy to see the amount of support that I received from the local law enforcement partners, the sheriff's departments of Cameron County, Hidalgo County, and Willacy County, and so many others, as well as the local law enforcement from police departments out here. A uh, huge appreciation for the city of Brownsville leadership, local officials, and the Office of Emergency Management that has helped tremendously as well. My appreciation to the government of Mexico as well, the INAMI team who has been out there, they're part of the uh, immigration department, who is helping us as well with the Title 42 returns. So there is a lot of movement out here. We're doing throughput of about uh, maybe 400 a shift, 500 a shift out to different locations, and we're gonna continue to do that. My concern are the safety and well-being of every migrant that is processed through here. We wanna ensure their quick transfer out. They don't last more than three hours at this location, maybe four, and they move on to what the next process along the way. So with that, I just wanted to give you a quick glimpse of our operations here on the ground, and I'd love to uh, introduce to you now our leadership that is here visiting us here in RGV, um, Mr. Secretary from Homeland Security. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Chavez. The situation at the border is a very serious one, a very challenging one, and a very difficult one. Every single day and every single night, day in and day out, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the United States Border Patrol agents are keeping our border secure. They are an extraordinary workforce, and I am, and this country is, incredibly grateful uh, for them. The situation is indeed very difficult. I was in Mac uh, McCallum yesterday, in McAllen yesterday, and I'm in Brownsville today. And what the purpose of my trip is to review our operations and to see our planning for the end of Title 42 in action. I met with Border Patrol agents. I have met with our extraordinary Office of Field Operations personnel of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. I met uh, with at Port Isabel with our Immigration and Customs Enforcement personnel, with local community leaders, law enforcement leaders, with nonprofit organizations as well. As Chief Chavez said, 
This requires a community response to a challenge to our communities. And that is indeed what we are bringing, a community response. It is no different across the entire region, across the entire Western Hemisphere. This is a regional challenge that requires regional solutions. It is not unique to the southern border of the United States, and I've spoken about this before. And therefore, three weeks ago, I was in Panama to meet with our Panamanian and Colombian partners, and we agreed to surge enforcement operations to prevent individuals from entering the very dangerous and treacherous Derien at the hands of ruthless smugglers. Earlier this week, the President's Homeland Security Advisor met with the President of Mexico and agreed upon an enforcement surge in the south of Mexico to prevent individuals from being exploited by smugglers as those vulnerable individuals are misinformed by the smugglers and brought to the southern border only to be returned. A regional challenge requires a regional solution. Let me give you a brief overview of our approach. As we indicated last week, we are building lawful pathways that will provide a safe and orderly way for individuals who qualify for relief under United States law to reach the United States safely. We are building on the success of our parole processes that we announced on January 5th for the Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans. We saw a 95% drop in the number of encounters of those individuals at our southern border because we built lawful pathways for them to access. And that is the model that we are building upon. Last Thursday, Secretary of State Tony Blinken and I announced the development of regional processing centers in different parts of South and Central America to enable individuals to access lawful pathways from those regional processing centers, whether they qualify for refugee processing, whether they qualify for our existing and expanding family reunification programs, whether they present acute vulnerabilities that may qualify them for humanitarian parole on a case-by-case -case basis. We are reaching the people where they are. It is not only our security obligation, it is our humanitarian responsibility to cut the smugglers out, and that is indeed what we are doing. We are building pathways. At the same time, at the same time, we will deliver consequences for individuals who arrive at our southern border irregularly. That is our commitment and our obligation as a way of cutting the smugglers out and taking care of the safety and needs of individuals who qualify for relief. In a post-Title 42 environment, we will be using our expedited removal authorities under Title 8 of the United States Code. That uh, allows us to remove individuals very quickly. We will, by May 11th, finalize the rule that we published in a proposed format that provides that individuals who do not access our lawful pathways will be presumed to be ineligible for asylum and will have a higher burden of proof to overcome that presumption of ineligibility. We are building lawful pathways and we are delivering consequences for those who do not use those meaningfully accessible pathways. The message is very clear. We are coming with the relief that our laws provide to the individuals in need. The border is not open. It has not been open, and it will not be open subsequent to May 11th. And the smugglers who exploit vulnerable migrants are spreading misinformation. They are spreading false information, lies in a way to lure vulnerable people to the southern border, and those individuals will only be returned. To the, to the individuals themselves who are thinking of migrating, do not believe the smugglers. Please access the official government publications. Please access the, the official government information on the Department of Homeland Security website for accurate information because you are being deceived. 
and you are risking your lives and your life savings only to meet a consequence that you do not expect at our southern border. To meet our objectives, we have been and continue to surge resources, personnel, transportation capabilities, airplanes to effect a greater number of removals every week, additional facilities, the remarkable facility that the United States Border Patrol set up here in collaboration with the community of Brownsville. This was set up in just 72 hours. We are surging resources. Earlier today, we also announced the distribution of additional funds to border communities, nonprofit organizations, and several interior cities to meet their needs in their partnership with us to address the situation at our border and to address the humanitarian needs of migrants. We distributed approximately $330 million more dollars uh, today for the benefit of those organizations. We have a plan. We are executing on that plan. I have come to McAllen and Brownsville to see firsthand that plan in action. Fundamentally, however, fundamentally, we are working within a broken immigration system that for decades has been in dire need of reform. That is a fact about which everyone agrees. And we urge Congress to fix our broken immigration system. And until then, we will do everything that we can within our authorities to provide an orderly and safe pathway for individuals who qualify for relief under the laws of the United States of America. Thank you, and with that, I will turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Kari Huffman of Customs and Border Protection. Uh, thank you, Secretary. First off, I'd like to say I'm very glad to be here along with the Secretary, Chief Chavez, Chief Ortiz, and the rest of the CBP team. We are facing a very, very challenging time. Leaders show what's important by where they spend their time. And the fact that the Secretary has spent so much time in this area re recognizes the fact this is a priority for him, it's a priority for our government to do everything we can. We are facing very, very challenging times. There's no question about that. And we have been preparing for these challenging times for quite some time, and we're ready. There's no better team to face this than the CBP team, which is a, a good example of, Zach, of, of our preparations, of the ability for, this, for the RGV sector to set up this, this process in three short days. It's, it's kind of uh, builds upon the lessons we've learned and how our preparation we've done that make us ready to, to take on this situation. We're surging resources quickly all across the border to different places that we needed. We've increased our capacity by a third, a third over the last 24 months to help us be prepared for this, and we're working hard to do this. We're focused on getting as many agents back on the line. We have been, uh, we've been hiring for the last uh, year or so uh, contractors and non-uniform personnel to do jobs that, law, that border flight agents normally do to get them back on the line. So it's very important to do that. To follow up on what the commissioner said, on May the 11th, it will still be unlawful to enter this country illegally with the we'll be relying upon our decades old title eight processes that we've used time and time again in the past to enforce the law and to protect the border that coupled with increasing in criminal prosecutions will allow for the rule of law for, to prevail on our border and that's our goal and that's the challenges we're facing but i want to spend a few minutes here to talk about the cbp team and tell you exactly how proud i am on the work they've done and continue to do I, for the last year and a half i have traveled this country and i'm uh, this many different stations, many different locations, talking to our workforce to better understand their challenges they're facing. And I can tell you, I'm sure the Secretary, Chief Ortiz, and Chief Chavez agree, we couldn't be more prouder than the work they do in the communities and the communities they work with, which is further identified and the risks they take. And I couldn't uh, close out and make in one moment about the work of our recently with the, the U.S. Border Patrol BORTAC team and how they raised up in the community to help uh, arrest that uh, a wanted murderer who'd been on the run for several days to help keep that community safe. That's the quality of the personnel you have working this border situation. That's a quality of the people in your community and I couldn't be more proud of them. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Ordiz to give more operational details about what's going on with our preparations. Chief. Good afternoon and thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Mr. Secretary, for coming down here to see firsthand the great work that's uh, unfolding uh, in Rio Grande Valley and South Texas. And then Chief Chavez for your leadership. I will tell you that uh, a couple weeks ago, the Secretary asked me, where do we need to go first 
Chief, and I said, before May 11th, when you go to South Texas, we knew that we were going to see some increases down here, and that has transpired over the last two weeks. Uh, Brownsville has traditionally been a slower area for us in South Texas, and what we've seen at, that's unfolded here just south of us is migrant populations from Venezuela have crossed uh, 24 hours a day. The chief responded with medical assets and resources. We've asked for some support from other agencies. We've got our Texas Department of Public Safety personnel working side by side with by our board tour agents, and we have our OFO partners, and then we have our state and local partners. Once again, this is a team effort. We're continuing to move these migrants into our processing facilities as quickly as we possibly can. We have tremendous capacity here in South Texas. We have had that for about six or seven years, and we're going to continue to leverage that to the best of our ability. As the Secretary mentioned, we're going to balance that against our border security mission set. We want to keep as many Border Patrol agents out on those front lines, allow our processing coordinators, our volunteers, our DOD personnel, the 1,500 DOD personnel, are going to help us on those admin functions so we can get agents back out on patrol. Ultimately, our goal is to keep these communities safe and make sure that our agents are safe when they're out there performing their duties each and every day. So, Mr. Secretary, thank Thank you for your continued support of the Border Patrol, and we appreciate the fact that you guys continue to cover this story because it is an important story. Thank you. Can you explain why you've seen this big surge in the last couple weeks? And if you're seeing this big of a surge ahead of May 11th or May 12th, what are you expecting come May 12th? So um, the, the surge over the past uh, couple weeks is really uh, focused on one particular demographic. We've seen an increase in the number of Venezuelan nationals coming to our border. Uh, it's very difficult to identify the cause. You know, the, the, um, the challenge of migration is, in one aspect, it's dynamism. It is a very complex phenomenon. Uh, we saw the, the tragic fire in the city of Juarez in, in Mexico and the impact domestically within Mexico. And since then, we saw over the past two weeks a significant surge of Venezuelans. We, are, we have reached an agreement uh, with the government of Mexico to address that surge, and we're going to see the results of that agreement very shortly. And if so, how prepared are you for a surge in terms of processing people? So just to make sure that everybody heard the, um, the question, uh, do we expect a, a surge? And if so, how prepared are we? So for as, as the commissioner uh, mentioned, as Commissioner Huffman mentioned, we've been preparing for well over uh, a year. It was in September of 2021 when we first developed a six-pillar plan uh, to address uh, the end of Title 42. We updated that uh, throughout uh, the, the calendar year 2022. So we've been preparing for quite some time, and we are ready. What we are e expecting is indeed a, a surge, um, and what we are doing is planning for different levels of a surge. That is what we do. We plan for different scenarios, so we are ready to address them, and we are indeed ready to address them. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for taking my question. Can you just talk a little bit about some of the things that you've seen on the ground, some of the concerns that you're hearing? Um, and given that we're in a region that's already seeing thousands of encounters a day, how confident are you that the measures that you've put in place are going to work? I think that there is no question that this is going to be extremely challenging. I do not want to understate the severity of the challenge that we expect to encounter. Uh, the, the border is a very, as I said at the very outset, it is a difficult situation. It requires not only a community of action on this side of the border, but it requires a community of action south of our border, not only with our Mexican partners, but with other countries throughout the region. And indeed, we have an international approach to an international uh, challenge. Uh, what I've seen on the ground in my visit to McAllen and to Brownsville is no different than what I've seen in my more than 15 prior trips to the border as the Secretary of Homeland Security. I have seen an extraordinary workforce in green uniform in the United States 
border patrol in blue you uniform in the office of field operations of u s customs and border protection across the expanse of the department of homeland security and quite frankly across the expanse of this entire administration this administration addresses challenges as one team in an all of government approach thank you for taking my question uh, Back in March in McAllen, you told uh, Republican lawmakers that the U.S. does not have an operational control of the southern border. Um, do you still stand by that statement? And if so, what is, um, do you need to gain control of the border? Yeah, so the question that was posed during my hearing was the uh, congressional legislative definition of operational control where nobody crosses the border. I've been doing this job for 32 years. We've never had operational control. Have we had various levels of control? Yeah, most certainly. Even while I was the acting chief or deputy chief here for five and a half years, this side of Rio Grande Valley was very secure, but out on my west side, we had sur surges quite often in Rio Grande City, Star County, and Hidalgo County. And that plays out across the entire stretch of the 2,000 miles border that we share with Mexico. And so I have some sectors that I have greater levels of uh, confidence in just because the flow isn't what it is. But this morning, Chief Chavez's team apprehended 2,300 people in this sector. And so that requires an awful lot of capacity and certainly poses some significant challenges for us. So I stick by my comments that I made during the hearing, but we've never had that. Ways and the plans that are in place, obviously, for majority Venezuelan migrants that was expanded to Haitian, Cuban, and Nicaraguan migrants. Why isn't that policy being enforced right now? Many of the migrants I'm meeting along the streets of Brownsville are swimming in between the ports of entry. As you have mentioned, if that happens, they're supposed to be returned. They're not being returned, and they're single adults without family here. Why is that happening? So um, uh, I think. Uh you are actually um, mistaken because the parole process for Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans that we first announced and implemented on January 5th is uh, underway and continues uh, to be underway. And we continue, if I may, if I may, it does. And if I may, we continue uh, to parole individuals of those four nationalities when they qualify under the program uh, that we established and announced. And that requires a sponsor here in the United States to ensure that those individuals have financial stability and they are able to arrive in a safe and orderly way. That in, is indeed underway. And we continue, and we continue to expel Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans. The number of Venezuelans that we've been able to expel has actually diminished over the past two weeks. The cause of that is a very complicated one. We've sat down with uh, the Mexican government and those expulsions, and of course, in a post-Title 42 environment, those removals will continue. And that is why the message is so important, that people, vulnerable people, are receiving false information they are being lied to that if they come and arrive at our border, that they can stay in the United States. That is not what the law provides. That is not the consequence that we will deliver. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. You mentioned after May 11th there would be, quote, a higher burden of proof that the migrants would need to show to be, have exceptions. Could you expand upon that? Could you also talk about the credible fear interviews and the processes that you're going through to expedite these migrants so many? So um, the rule is being finalized, and until that uh, rule uh, is indeed final and published, um, it is uh, difficult for me to, to answer the question just as a matter of law because it is not set it is not established until it is actually final uh, and published. But the general concept, the general concept is as follows, that individuals who access the lawful pathways that we deliver for them will be able to come to the United States in a safe and orderly way. Those who travel irregularly in the hands of smugglers, because I have to repeat again, it is a security and humanitarian imperative that we cut the smugglers out. Those who arrive irregularly at our border will 
be presumed, absent some limited exceptions, will be presumed to be ineligible for asylum, and they will meet a rebuttable presumption of ineligibility. To overcome that presumption, they will have to meet a higher threshold of proof. Does it, you were saying the, the smugglers are leading them to misinformation, and if they come out here illegally, if they cross illegally and they don't meet the threshold, that they will be expelled. That's the message you're sending. Can you walk us through what that looks like? Is that like a mass deportation, something different than what we've been seeing? So, so Griff, um, in a when Title 42 comes to an end on May 11th, we will use, as we have expressed before, our traditional immigration authorities, the ones that we sought to use earlier when we sought to end Title 42, but were prevented from doing so uh, by a court. And Title 8 of the United States Code, our traditional immigration authorities actually deliver a consequence, because when someone is removed, when someone does not qualify for relief and is removed from the United States, they face an at least five-year bar from admission into the United States. So the consequence is going to be more severe. And what we will do, what we will do is remove individuals who do not qualify for relief under the standard that will be set by the rule that we ha will have finalized by May 11th. Thank you so much. I just have a question for you, Mr. Secretary, and a quick one for Chief Ortiz. Um, Mr. Secretary, we've heard from mayors here in the Rio Grande Valley and across Texas that they're concerned they're not equipped to handle the number of migrants entering their streets. DHS just allocated, as you mentioned, 300 million to NGOs in border communities. But does the federal government have a role in standing up housing and medical care, especially when hospitals, NGOs, and churches are at capacity and migrants are sleeping on their sidewalks? And just quickly to Chief Ortiz, can you explain geographically where troops will be located? Which sectors are they staying? So, uh, Nicole, we are working very, very closely with um, city and local officials, as I have um, uh, expressed earlier, we are working with nonprofit organizations. This requires a community response, and we are providing funding through our emergency food and shelter program. Congress uh, allocated $800 million to this program. Last year, we only had $150 million. We have allocated a great number of those funds already to resource the communities to address the needs that you express. There are approximately $363 million left to distribute. We will do that through the new Shelter and Services Program. The community challenges require a community response, and we are working holistically with communities across the border to address this challenge. And then with respect to the DOD personnel, so currently we have 2,500 DOD personnel supporting the CBP Border Patrol mission, and they're housed and stationed across the southwest border. The additional 1,500 personnel that are uh, going to be allocated over the next few weeks will be based in El Paso, but what that will allow me to do is resources that I've been dedicating to El Paso because it has been a much busier place over the last six months. I'm going to be able to reallocate those to some of the other sectors that require some additional capacity. So we're going to be able to balance that out. We've got a plan. We've been working with our partners with DOD, and we appreciate their support. Thank you. Right. I, Thanks, want to, Luisa, I, I want to say something more about that, if I may, Chief Ortiz and Nicole. Um, the deployment of Department of Defense personnel is nothing new. Um, since 2006, every single year since 2006, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and specifically the United States Border Patrol, has relied upon additional resources from the Department of Defense. This year is the first year, thanks to President Biden budget, this is the first this is the first year since 2011 that we have been able to dedicate 300 new Border Patrol agents to the United States Border Patrol. The President's fiscal year 2024 budget asks for an additional 350 Border Patrol agents. We are plussing up the United States Border Patrol for the first time in more than a decade, and we are committed to continuing to do so. Resources are vital. 
uh, to the effort that we have underway. The challenges will be significant. The plans we have pl in place are tailored to meet those challenges. We have the greatest workforce in the world to fulfill our mission, and we will do so. And I'm so incredibly proud to support them. Thank you all for being here.